On April 22nd, 1998, Disney's Animal Kingdom opened at Walt Disney World in Florida in an elaborate Earth Day ceremony attended by CEO Michael Eisner, famed conservationist and primatologist Jane Goodall, and Drew Carey. Animal Kingdom was Disney World's fourth gate, following the openings of Magic Kingdom in 1971, Epcot Center in 1982, and then called MGM Studios in 1989. At the time, Disney also boasted three water parks, two of those being Typhoon Lagoon, which opened in 1989, and Blizzard Beach in 1995, and the third being the ill-fated River Country, which opened in 1976, and isn't looking too good anymore. Much like each park that came before it, Animal Kingdom was based on a central theme. This time, all attractions focused on conservation and the natural environment. Opening day attractions included the Festival of the Lion King, a music and acrobatic show featuring characters from the Disney animated movie, Kilimanjaro Safaris, an expansive safari tour through the park's nature reserve, and Countdown to Extinction, now known as Dinosaur, a fast-paced e-ticket attraction that involved going back in time to capture a live dinosaur and narrowly avoiding an asteroid impact. In the Oasis, a small tropical garden that serves as the park's introduction area, the dedication plaque can be found that was unveiled by Michael Eisner on opening day. Its inscription begins, Welcome to a kingdom of animals. Real, ancient, and imagined. Now in 1998, Animal Kingdom had plenty of real animals. Today, the park is estimated to have anywhere upwards of 2,000 animals from over 50 different species. Dinoland USA ensured it also had plenty of ancient animals. But imagined animals? Well, they were nowhere to be seen. When the park was first being developed, there were plans to build a land named Beastly Kingdom, which would be the home to mythical animals such as dragons, unicorns, and sea monsters. Unfortunately, as development went on, Disney simply lacked the funding to be able to include both Beastly Kingdom and Dinoland USA in the finished park. So in the end, Dinoland USA won out, and Beastly Kingdom was put on the back burner and replaced with a far cheaper Camp Mini Mickey. However, remnants of the Beastly Kingdom plan still remained on opening day, and even now, not just in the dedication plaque, but in park signage, in the short-lived Discovery Riverboat tours, and even right there in the middle of the Animal Kingdom logo. As time went on, the likelihood of Beastly Kingdom being finally added to the park began to fade, but as Animal Kingdom celebrated its fifth anniversary, the promise of imagined animals surfaced once again in a different way. In the shadows of Mount Everest, a train awaits. But be warned, those attempting to reach the summit must face him. Expedition Everest, a chilling new ride at Disney's Animal Kingdom Park. After first being announced in 2003, Expedition Everest, Legend of the Forbidden Mountain, officially opened on April 7th, 2006. The roller coaster became the tallest attraction at Walt Disney World, standing at 199 and a half feet just six inches taller than the Tower of Terror, and importantly, six inches shorter than the legal requirement to install an aircraft beacon. At the time, it was also the most expensive roller coaster in the world, costing $100 million, a record that was only beaten in 2019 with the opening of Hagrid's Magical Creatures motorbike adventure at Universal's Islands of Adventure. It's a richly detailed and importantly really fun ride, and definitely one of the best attractions at Animal Kingdom. Well, you know, apart from Dinosaur. The ride's backstory takes place in a remote Himalayan village, where several buildings formerly owned by the Royal Ananda Putti Company have been repurposed by tour company Himalayan Escapes. Riders embark on a trek named Expedition Everest on a refurbished steam train previously used to bring tea leaves down from the mountains. The plan for the trek is to travel to Everest's base camp, taking a shortcut through the Forbidden Mountain a mysterious place thought to be guarded by a ferocious yeti who fiercely opposes people trespassing through his territory. But I'm sure that's just a myth, right? Expedition Everest's backstory brings up an interesting misconception that most people have when they visit the ride, which is that none of this ride actually takes place on Mount Everest, but instead on the Forbidden Mountain. This isn't Mount Everest. This is. Although I sort of feel like Disney should have expected that their guests would mistake the mountain for Everest, considering the ride is called, you know, Expedition Everest. But yeah, during the ride you attempt to get to Mount Everest, but never actually make it for 
reasons we'll discuss. Riders get their first taste of the legend of the Yeti through the ride's queue. Richly detailed artifacts demonstrate the Yeti's importance in local culture, and a makeshift museum shows the history of supposed Yeti sightings, including alleged footprints and items recovered from a lost expedition that went missing in 1982 during an attempt to trek through the Forbidden Mountain. On the ride itself, guests ascend up the mountain and the foreshadowing continues, passing yet more carvings and artifacts related to the Yeti. And then when they've almost reached the very top of the snow-covered mountain pass, they discover the track has been torn apart, and they plummet backwards into the dark caverns of the mountain. The train stops as guests see a shadow of the Yeti tearing apart yet more pieces of the track, and the train lurches forward once again, this time out of the mountain and back through another cave where finally they come face to face with the Yeti himself, roaring and reaching out at the train as riders make a daring escape away from the mountain and back to the station. At least, that's how it was supposed to go. The climactic, show-stopping moment of Expedition Everest, the gigantic 25-foot tall Yeti animatronic, was the largest and most complex animatronic Walt Disney Imagineering had ever built. Weighing 4 tons and containing 19 different actuators to control its movements, the Yeti can move up to 5 feet vertically and 18 inches horizontally. It's so large, it's actually unable to support the weight of its movements through its legs alone and instead relies on a large boom arm to move it around and act as a counterweight. To put it lightly, the Yeti was a masterpiece of engineering, and Disney knew that. WDI hyped up the Yeti big time, and with it being so integral to the story of the ride, it was incredibly important that the illusion of the Yeti was successful. And it was. When Expedition Everest opened to the public, it was very well received. The Yeti moved around and swatted at riders just as intended for a few months. You see, whenever you have moving parts that are as large as the Yeti is, they always pose a significant risk to the animatronic's structural integrity, and so great care has to be taken when designing and installing it. While there's never been an official answer, the generally accepted story is this. Sometime after opening, it became apparent that the sheer size and power of the Yeti's movements were beginning to cause damage to the structure holding it in place. The speculation is that the concrete base for the Yeti wasn't given enough time to properly set, and so there was a real danger that the support structures for the animatronic could break, which at best could result in a damaged Yeti and an expensive repair bill for Disney. But at worst, could just result in the 4-ton, 25-foot tall Yeti collapsing in on guests as they ride through at high speed. Which, considering the Yeti is trying to protect the mountain from intruders, might be a pretty good outcome for him but probably not for the guests. Disney tends to keep major mechanical issues like this pretty quiet, so a lot of the potential implications of the Yeti problem are difficult to predict. There has been some speculation that the movements of the Yeti were also causing damage to the internal structure of the mountain itself, potentially risking a collapse of the entire ride, but this isn't a claim I've been able to verify anywhere. In fact, the Yeti, the mountain facade, and the roller coaster are three separate structures and actually don't touch each other. Regardless, the animatronic structural integrity was still a serious enough problem that it couldn't be ignored. I mean, a major part of a multi-million dollar project shaking itself to pieces because it's too large and too powerful is a big deal. And so, only a short time after opening, the Yeti was placed into what's called B mode, an operating mode where its movement was switched off entirely, leaving not a Yeti that reaches out and tries to grab guests, but a static Yeti, who just stands around and looks scary. In its place, some wind effects and a strobe light were used instead to simply provide the illusion of movement without the added risk. And it's this strobing effect that led to the Yeti being given its new name by Disney fans. Disco Yeti. There's also no definitive answer as to when the Yeti was fully switched over to B mode. Some sources will tell you that the A mode Yeti was switched off as early as a few months into Expedition Everest's opening, whereas others claim that they saw it as late as 2008. Videos online show the Yeti working in A mode in 2007, so it's possible that over the first couple of years it was switched on and off as Disney saw fit. As for myself, I'm convinced that I saw the Yeti in its full glory in summer 2007 a little over a year after the ride's opening. I was only eight, and I remember it being pretty terrifying. Going underneath it with it swinging its arms that you really felt like it was gonna hit you. So the largest animatronic that Disney ever made was damaging its own structure because of how massive and powerful it was. So Disney had to turn it off and replace its movements with disco lights instead. And then they came along and fixed it, right? Right? Sadly, no. 
at least not yet. Over the years, Are You Going To Fix The Yeti has almost become as much of a meme in Disney circles as Disco Yeti has. It's long been speculated that the Yeti sits in a difficult to access part of the mountain, and that the amount of work needed to get to it and carry out all the necessary maintenance to safely put it back into A mode would require a significant amount of downtime for the ride. Maybe a few months? maybe up to a year, and with an e-ticket attraction as popular as Expedition Everest, shutting it down for that long could be a serious problem for Disney. So the best option is just to leave Disco Yeti running for 15 years. Some of this speculation was put to rest in 2020 by Joe Rohde, the veteran lead designer of Animal Kingdom and principal creative behind the attraction. In response to a tweet asking about the Yeti, Joe said, It's not an issue of maintenance access. It's an unexpected and unforeseen set of issues, very complex, with no easy or timely solutions as of yet. In the past, Joe Rohde has made statements about his commitment to one day fixing the Yeti, but with his retirement from WDI earlier this year, it seems that that promise may never come to fruition. The shutdown of Disney World caused by the pandemic led many to believe that the Yeti would be fixed then too, as there will be ample time to carry out more invasive maintenance work on Everest. Reports have also been made about Disney filing for construction permits for the ride, causing yet more rumours to fly around about potential Yeti fixing projects taking place. Sadly so far, there's been no concrete information. Get it? Concrete? Because the Yeti is on badly set concrete? Never mind. Sadly so far, there's been no concrete information about the Yeti getting fixed. Even after 15 years of Expedition Everest, the Yeti still operates in B-Mode today. It's quite sad to see it now, because the Yeti was supposed to be this huge, mind-blowing set piece, but it very quickly got reduced to only a fraction of what it could have been. Maybe the problems facing the Yeti really are so complex and unforeseen that Disney simply don't know how to fix them. Whenever you're trying to do something new, there's not exactly a blueprint that tells you how to fix everything and it's very likely you'll face problems that nobody's ever seen before. Or maybe Disney just doesn't want to fix it. The Yeti is only seen for a few seconds, so it might not even be worth their time to fix it when the strobe effect achieves a fairly similar result anyway. After all, the average guest probably has no concept of A modes and B modes, and is unlikely to even notice that the Yeti isn't moving. And if an animatronic breaks in a mountain, but nobody's around to notice it, has it really broken? Still, the story of the Disco Yeti is a disappointing one. Expedition Everest is still a fantastic ride, but once you know about this, it does act as a blight on its reputation. Maybe one day in the future, Disney will finally fix the Yeti. But I guess for now, we'll all have to be content with a bit of Disco. Thanks for watching my latest video. I wanted to go down a bit of a different route with this one, trading the commentary style for a more factual voiceover video essay type video. It's always fun to try something new, and I hope you've enjoyed hearing me talk about this topic. Disney history is really interesting to me, and there's so much that you can talk about, so maybe I'll make another video like this in the future. But for now, if you're new here, please consider subscribing. If there's something else you'd like me to cover, let me know, and I'll see you next time.